and I have the pleasure and I have the pleasure of doing that. And I would like to uh, appreciate all of uh, all of the panelists for accepting and being with us today. The first panelist for today is Dr. Andrew Hegel, who is the Chief Science Officer and Director of Operations in Enthont Biomedical in Vancouver. The second uh, panelist is Kendra Mann, who is Urban Solutions Specialist in S3 Canada in Vancouver. And, uh, and the third one, the last one, but not the least, is Dr. Olga Pena, who is the Manager Biomedical Devices Unit at National Emerging Strategic Stockpile Emergency Management Branch in Public Health Agency of Canada in Ottawa. So uh, I would like to ask uh, every, every, all of these panelists briefly introduce themselves and respond to the question that what inspires you about your current work? I would like to start with Dr. Andrew Hegel. And yes, and the question is that introduce please yourself briefly and, uh, and, and, and respond to this question that what inspires you about the, your current work? Please, Andrew. Sure, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, I've had an interesting path. Um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start where I'm at now and then I'll kind of tell you how I got here and, and why I'm inspired. Um, so I'm the Chief uh, Science Officer and Director of Operations at Entheon Biomedical. We're a startup company that's working on mental health, specifically substance use disorders. And, um, and my role has been to essentially organize clinical trials, but also run all the R&D uh, for the company. Um, and, and that has, because it's a startup, that has included lots of, um, lots of roles, lots of hats that I've worn, and I'm happy to get into that. Um, I'm inspired because um, after a long, circuitous, path I've, I've uh, finally affecting real people. I'm helping humans on the ground uh, who need help. Um, my, my sort of science career started in, in cell culture and fruit flies. Essentially, I did a PhD in the University of Michigan, where I'm from. I came to Vancouver in 2007, really not so much because I wanted to um, or I knew, not, not because I even knew what I wanted to do, but because I had an opportunity to come here. Um, and there were, there are lots of reasons that got me here. Um, and then I found myself in 2007, 2008, um, facing the, the, the recession that hit and thinking, wow, this is a, a good place to, to hang out while, while the job market settles, right? So I ended up doing postdoc at UBC for, uh, as long as I could, really, ended up doing uh, six years total. Um, along the way, I helped to um, establish the postdoctoral fellows office, uh, which I'm happy to talk about, but that's not really what I'm here for today. Um, and I eventually sort of figured, hey, you know what, I need to start something new. And um, I left UBC at the end, um, kind of thinking, hey, I want to work at biotech. Um, got a small job at a small company here in town, just starting from the ground level, just doing like conference planning and account management stuff and it was probably not where i expected to be but i figured hey i need to dig in and sort of um you know learn how business works um during that time i had a friend who who said hey uh andy you know i know you from your postdoc you're good at managing things and i need someone to help organize the lab and and next thing i know i'm involved in a venture to establish an analytical chemistry laboratory um, at the department of pharmacology in ubc um, and that became um, kind of didn't really go very far. We didn't really have a lot of money, but we sort of just tried it out. And next thing we knew, we were part of the uh, therapeutics company based in that department um, where we had collaborated with pharmacologists to start to work on um, treating pain with cannabinoids. Um, so that turned into a small startup. We did a small clinical trial. I managed a lot of the preclinical work. It started moving from flies into rodents and, and grad, uh, undergraduates. And um, the next thing we knew, we were um, acquired by a public company and they kind of closed everything down. So I found myself once again looking for something else and uh, managed to connect with um, Entheon, my current company, who uh, um, you know I've been with for about three years now. So that's that's where I'm at, and I think um, I'm inspired by the the sort of um, the scope of what I've done from from going from molecules through different model systems, and now I'm finally treating, uh, helping to treat people uh, in, in the real world. So that that's a good feeling. Thanks. That's 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 wonderful, Dr. Higgle. Really, it's 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 amazing that you have done tremendous research work during your postdoc, and then you started your your own company, the startup. That's that's amazing. 
very glad to have you. So the next the next panelist is Ken Ramon, please. I would appreciate if you could introduce yourself and, and respond to a question that what inspires you about your current work, please. Yes, for sure. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Kendra. I'm an urban solution specialist with Esri Canada, which is, I would say, arguably kind of um, the primary GIS software company out there. Um, so I also feel like I didn't have a very straight path to where I got to. Um, it does feel in some ways like I sort of fell into it, but it wasn't exactly what I planned. Um, so I started off actually with doing a bachelor's degree in environmental science applied biology here at Simon Fraser University. And I was into it, um, but I don't think it was something that I was necessarily super passionate about. Like it was something where it did feel like I was in a good spot in, in the sense of learning interesting things and being able to affect change, I suppose, um, in a positive way. But it wasn't something that when I actually got to the coursework and later on into the working world, it wasn't something that I felt like it was necessarily where I was meant to be. I did do a few co-op jobs, um, mostly in government with AgriFood Canada, DFO. But when I was about halfway through my undergrad, I decided to do um, some of my electives. And one of the ones that popped up was GIS, Geographic Information Systems. So I wasn't actually familiar with it before that at all. I had no idea what it was, um, but electives being electives, I had to take something. So I decided to go for it. And, you know, as a nightmare of finding out you like something a lot more than what your undergrad degree is, um, I found it like super interesting. I thought it was a great intersection between science and data analysis, but also kind of like the visual aesthetic appeal. Um, so it was something that I was really into, but at that point in time, I felt like I had been in school way longer than I wanted to be, and I just needed to get out. So there was actually a full-fledged uh, bachelor's program in GIS that is offered at SFU, but I decided to go instead with the Spatial Information uh, System Certificate, which is obviously um, a shorter time commitment. And it was great. And I think I did a couple more co-op jobs after that that were GIS related, one in Ministry of Agriculture, but eventually I settled out in what was my first full-time job at BC Hydro. And that was back in the environmental side of things. So I was doing some compliance database management, um, which was great. Like it was a great company to work for. It definitely was good benefits. It was a great company, but I felt when I was there, again, that feeling that it wasn't something that I was necessarily passionate about. And there was the opportunity to move up. There, they, they would offer to pay for the master's as long as it was somewhat related. And there were a lot of positions, but just looking around at everything that was available, it just, it didn't seem something that interested me. So in the end, I wound up going back to SFU to do a master's in geography with a focus on GIS. And I did my thesis research in um, spatial analysis methods or multi-criteria evaluation methods and applying them to three dimensions where they're typically limited to 2D. Um, and it's just something that's really interested me. And I was, you know, preparing to get into the working world again, kind of the timing was off. Like Andrew mentioned, like for me, I was doing my master's, um, during COVID. So I wasn't sure what the job market was going to be coming out of that. So that had me a little bit worried. Um, it's the first time I created a LinkedIn account trying to, you know, improve my chances. Um, but as the way it turned out, I was doing obviously a few scholarships and side projects for my master's as a lot of us do. And I actually wound up, wound up winning a few of them offered through Esri, which again was great for me because that is the primary software company out there for GIS. Um, and then ultimately I went on to do not only the SFU level, but I applied for the national level and luckily I managed to win that. And when they're posting a little blurb on their website about the winner each year, they do ask for some information. So they reached out to me for that. And as I responded to them, they came back and asked, by the way, would you be interested in this position with us? So in that way, it wasn't something I planned or necessarily worked towards myself, but it worked out really well. So now I am in this um, urban solution specialist role where I'm partly in education and research, which although not academia has a very academic component to it. Like we do kind of everything a grad student does in a sense, like we deliver workshops, guest lectures, um, we participate in contributing to academic research projects with universities. Um, and then the other half of my work, I'm in professional services. So working with clients, um, mainly municipalities to design these urban models for them essentially. So I actually 
I love my job as it is. Like I've always really been to GIS. I didn't really have an idea exactly of where I wanted to apply my knowledge and skill set to. But now I really like this intersection between kind of a mix of working with clients to problem solve um, their problems that they're looking to do, but also kind of pushing the envelope in terms of the academic research and figuring out how we can apply our software to new and novel, exciting ways. Um, and I'm just generally interested in the work I do. And again, um, being in that urban and 3D side of things, it's really great to have kind of the scientific aspect and the visual aspect as well, all merged into one job. So yeah, so I that, guess that, that kind of summarizes it. <laughs> that That's wonderful, Kendra. I'm, I'm very glad that we have you on board, that you have the experience of going kind of more going to industry or non-academic research more quicker than than doing your PhD or postdoc. So that's mm -hmm. wonderful to have you here and hear about your experience uh, on, on that way. And yeah, and uh, and I would like to ask Dr. Dr. Pena for, for introducing, introducing themselves and respond to the question that, uh, that what inspires them in their work. Please, Olga. Absolutely, thank you, Emad. Uh, so before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the unceded traditional territories of the Algonquin Nation. I am currently in Ottawa, speaking to you all. Um, I also would like to disclose that I am not here representing, representing in any way my current employer, and my presence here is obviously uh, in my personal choice and desire to share with all of you my personal views and career on career development as well as my own experiences. Um, so moving on, just to provide you a quick introduction <laughs> of myself. Uh, so I was born and raised in Colombia. Um, I am from a very, very small town in the middle of the Andes Cordillera that is called Chicoral. Uh, I was raised by a low income, uh, low middle income family uh, where my parents, while they were elementary educated only, uh, they placed a strong focus on education for their kids. So um, I was able to attend university thanks to their efforts. And then from there on, I was very interested on the research side of things after I finished my clinical microbiology undergraduate in Colombia. And so I uh, decided to go uh, out to the United States. And I did several uh, years of research internship working in genetics research and immunology cancer research before I started my PhD at UBC with Robert Gang with Bob Hancock, which you might all know from the microbiology and immunology department. Um, I did my research focusing on sepsis, uh, basically uh, trying to understand the immunopathology of sepsis. Um, and from those uh, discoveries throughout my PhD, uh, we were able to understand uh, better this uh, this uh, disease, and as well to identify some specific biomarkers that were uh, potentially to be used uh, as a diagnostic or prognostic method. Um, from there on, I went to Australia. They uh, at, at, um, what I did more uh, research on infectious diseases, specifically on viral infections. Um, and then that was a short postdoc. I came back and uh, Bob has actually, my former PhD supervisor has launched uh, uh, an initial um, uh, startup on based on the discoveries of my PhD. So I also supported those efforts, uh, starting with that. Uh, but I also work as a research manager uh, uh, with one of the respiratory research groups at UBC. Um, so that was for a couple of years and then um, um, I forgot to mention that during my PhD, I also had a baby, I got married and I had a baby. Uh, so I, at that point in my career, in my career also where the decision making of my family to settle in roots. And uh, so that's why also we were starting to look uh, as an immigrant family in Canada, where were the best place to, to be living in. And uh, Ottawa always attracted me from the perspective that uh, I was able to potentially enter uh, the government of Canada uh, with the intention of breaking many of the barriers that I have faced as a woman, as a, a woman in science, as an immigrant, uh, and as a researcher overall, um, to try to understand, understand better uh, the, the research environment and, and all the, um, as well to transfer all my uh, knowledge and skills uh, from that perspective, uh, working from this side on, in a way. Uh, so what inspired me on, on the work that I'm doing right now? So I joined the government actually through a program that is called the Science Policy uh, Fellowship from MITACS. 
Um, unfortunately, the program just closed this year, but it ran for over five years. Um, and when I initially joined, it was from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, through the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, and I was working with a, a global forum uh, of um, um, government organizations uh, trying to focus on biosafety level three and biosafety level four uh, zoonotic laboratories. Um, so at, at, at that way, I was pretty involved in all the research and I joined just prior to the pandemic. So you can imagine the, the level of uh, in, intensity on that front, but very interesting work in terms of being at the forefront of all the research that was being done through the world and through all the major government laboratories on, on, on COVID-19 research. Then I was kind of hunted to, to come to the Public Health Agency of Canada. And right now I am with the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile, which is a unit that uh, the main mandate is to actually support provinces, territories, and First Nation communities in health during health emergencies. And I'm currently managing uh, in an acting role of um, the biomedical devices unit, which basically possess all the biomedical devices that are needed for hospitals and clinics and so on uh, to respond to health emergencies. So as I say, it's, it's in a way is very inspirational and, and to see that uh, I can actually see the impact of my work uh, directly allocated to all Canadians across the country. Um, so that definitely actually make, make a big difference into what I do on an everyday basis. That, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, Dr. Pena. It's always hard to be the first, but you, but you were the first generation university student in your family, I believe. And then you, you became the first generation immigrant. So these are wonderful. And I want to start my, the, my, my, sec, my, la, my second question from you. So from you, Olga, that how is non-academic research different from academic research? So non-academic research versus academic research. And uh, how do you compare it with a uh, a non-research job, so as an industry job, if you call that way. And following that, that would be my follow-up question, that is your non-academic career fulfills your, your values and goals that you had in mind compared to the academic career that you could have taken? So these are the questions. So comparing non-academic research to academic research, and if it's aligned with your, uh, with your career goals and objectives that you had in mind, please. That's absolutely okay. absolutely uh so for what i can say i think what is important for me or what has been important for me from day one is to ensure that what i do whether it was at the bench doing research directly uh or you know in front of the computer doing assessments research assessment on an ongoing basis uh is that i can see the impact that i can do in the world with the work that i do um and on both fronts i i definitely could see that uh, right now, uh, I can obviously, it's a different type of research, as I say, I am not as a, as a biomedical scientist in a way or life scientist, scientist. Uh, it's a different type of research. Uh, so what I do usually is uh, assessments related to try to understand basically for uh, what is the research out there and how we can apply it to the to uh, proper informed decision making to uh, government leaders. Uh, so it's, it's actually kind of transferring as well and moving back and forth that knowledge from academia as well to the impact that actually can do into that decision making that is being done in government on a, on a daily basis. So I think that that's uh, equally impactful and I think that I, I feel in a way very fulfilled in that way. Awesome. That's wonderful. And, uh, and I'm gonna ask the same question from Kendra. So how do you compare the non-academic research work that you are doing with an academic research and if if you have any idea about that and is it fulfilling your 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 certain values and goals that you had in mind i would say so i mean maybe it's a little different for my field i would say but like i think there is a little bit more of an overlap between the academic and non-academic research aspect for me at least um i think the main thing that I've really enjoyed that I found fulfilling for this particular job is when I'm doing the non-academic research, it's kind of the main difference between that and academic is theory versus application. Like a lot of the work I was doing when I was in doing my master's, a lot of it was applied and theory-based. Not to say that there aren't specific applications when you go to do um, 
further along in academia and you make a career out of it. Um, but for like pretty much everything I do when I'm working in my current job, it's to help, you know, a city like plan out its um, implement a zoning plan or it's to help a certain company with a project, whether it's implementing some um, technology or like hydro dams or power lines or something like that. So you actually get to first like maybe research in the, sometimes it's more of testing it, uh, modeling it, simulating it, just to get an idea through the analysis of what's feasible. But a lot of times we are actually helping the companies find out what they're going to do um, in the real world. So I feel like in that aspect, it's a lot more fulfilling because I do get to work with different companies. I get more, ex I get more networking. I get more exposure. Um, a lot of the times I think in academia, there's maybe a tendency, at least for myself, to kind of just be sticking to what you already know, all the, the software you know, the methodologies you know, and actually being able to work with these other people and these other companies and branch out a little bit, you get to expose yourself to their methods and adopt their ways as well. Um, and then again, just being able to apply all of that and apply it to a real world situation where they can implement it. Um, I think that's really valuable for me. That's wonderful, Kendra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your main point was that that with the non-academic research, you can be exposed in in different with different companies with different work atmospheres, which is wonderful, really. I want to ask the same question from Dr. Hegel, and also I want to ask him a follow-up question: that uh, that is there a clear is there is there a clear career growth promotion path after that you compared your uh, your non, the non-academic career with academic, so that would be my follow follow-up question for you. That what's the clear? Do you think that is there any clear uh, career growth path for that? Please, Andrew. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think with the I can answer both of those sort of together, but I think to start off, um, so my experience is going to be kind of coming from the startup world. So I can't really talk about what it's like to work at you know, Pfizer or a, a big pharma company, right? I've, I've, I've always worked for small startups. And so that in and of itself is going to be a little bit different than working in a, a you know, a department of a company. Um, as I said, I've worn a lot of hats and that's everything from handling regulatory stuff to, um, to, to patent applications, to being on the board of directors, to going down and trying to raise money. Um, and, and what I will say is that if you, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, government or, or, you know, nonprofits, if you do end up working for a company, you are beholden to their deadlines and, and those deadlines and milestones often come down to money, right? So often what you might find is, hey, we can't continue this project. You got to just shut it down and pivot. And you just, you can't just kind of fiddle around with it for months or years like you might be able to do if you're working as a, maybe say a tenure track faculty member or you might have some grants, but you can kind of have free reign to do things. So you will have, you'll find that there'll be some constrictions into how far you can sort of take uh, research projects. So for example, um, you know, for a clinical trial, I might have to speak with different contract research organizations to direct their non-clinical, that is like, you know, some basic animal work, toxicology, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, we've had to, you know, pull the pro pull the plug on, on certain assays because they've taken too long or for whatever reason, we have to move on. We have to do a different different project, a different trial. And so I think, you know, you know, one big difference is that you have a little less freedom, um, I think, in a non-academic job that's a research-focused job, uh, because you're going to always be beholden to the quarterly deadlines, um, corporate milestones. And then I think, you know, back when I was a student, you know, we always talked about dark side versus, you know, the you know, the academic side, and it's it's not really like that. Um, you know, I found that in my roles, because I've been at the sort of director level and being at that sort of general operations level, I've been able to kind of, um, you know, help direct those sorts of things in a way that it's never felt like, I never felt like I got the rug pulled out from under me necessarily. Um, but, but you know, my, my company at UBC, uh, Canada Therapeutics, you know, when we got bought out and they shut down the research department, it's like, there's nothing I could do about that. That was a monetary decision because that particular bubble had popped and they didn't, couldn't afford a clinical trial. So they, they cut off the clinical trial before it was even really finished. And that stings a little bit, but at the same time, 
you know, you move on. And, you know, all those things add into, I think, the second part of your question, which is that sort of linearity between, you know, transitioning from a non-academic, uh, academic to non-academic research. There's no clear path. I mean, for me, it was a lot of stops and starts and trying this out. But it's, you know, when I look back on it now, there is a clear thread. You know, one thing led to the next. But I tell you one thing, I'm not working in ion channel physiology the way I was as a grad student. Not at all. You know, I, I carried part of that into my postdoc and I got interested in other aspects of neuroscience and genetics and behavior. And then, you know, what I carried out of that and what I do now, it doesn't have anything to do with fruit flies or ion channels, but it's all the other stuff you pick up along the way and the people you talk to, right? So um, everything kind of led directly into the next thing, but not in any obvious way and not in any real way that you can plan. And so one bit of advice is to just, I would say, keep your mind open, be ready for opportunities when they come, because you might never know where they come from. You know, when I left uh, my postdoc and flung myself out into the, you know, the weird wide world of uh, Vancouver Biotechs, which in 2013 was, again, kind of a hard time, a lot of hiring freezes on, things like that. I had to kind of take what I could find, and it was, it was, it was someone that I knew from that postdoc from in a different lab who was like, hey, I want to try something. Andy, you know how to run a lab. You'd be my, you know, be my ops guy. And it had nothing to do with where, where I was working at the time. But all those things together made me a good candidate for that role. And um, I would say everything since then has built on that in ways that, you know, I may not have been obvious at the time, but, but in retrospect, you know, you're always growing as a person, a person adding layers. Um, so I think one mistake you think of as a, as a graduate student is that whatever you're working on now is going to determine your whole path and it's going to be like this is what I'm going to do now and maybe you get really really good at some technical skill you know what like yeah you can be passionate about that and if you just love doing that one thing or whatever like whether there was me it was like running gels or you know western blots and it was like, like I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life but you know all those soft skills which I'll come back to later you know become really really important being able to talk to an audience, presenting things, communicating, you know, being able to talk about, you know, details of your of your project or even just your, you know, what is it you're doing in your PhD? If you can explain that to your family over, you know, you know, Christmas dinner, um, and they understand it, then you know you've been able to like actually get that idea across. And so it's it's those sorts of things that aren't 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 that easy, but they come to you as you go along. And so I would I would say like don't discount all those sorts of um, what you don't think of as being skills, but they but they very much are the skills that you're going to need to kind of explore all your options later. That's that's wonderful, Andrew. Yeah, you mentioned about transferable skills, which are important in terms of when we want to transfer from academia to non-academic research. And also, you mentioned that the career growth path is not linear, so it's, we can call it non-linear, especially. I believe in my experience after PhD, because before PhD, until you are doing your PhD, everything that if you are going from one degree to another, so everything is straightforward, right? So everything is, you know that what you want to do. But after that, when it comes to postdoc, when it comes to research, there's always, there is always a debate that for how long you would like to be a postdoc or how long you would like to do research. Would you like to stick for only one year, two years, or and then to see that if you can get into faculty positions or you want just you want to quit after one year, two years and go to industry. But that duration is very debatable between different people and different ideas. But that's wonderful that you talk about it. So my next question is about that you try you you talked about the transition. Uh, I will, I would like to start with you again, Andrew, and ask you about that. So did you 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 did six years of postdoc, which is impressive. And I want to know that what, it, what, what was uh, your transition from postdoc at to industry to non-academic research was easy or hard? It's a very simple question. And the many of people, many of postdocs uh, are concerned or even grad students that if they go to industry because they have a dream of being a faculty or teach or, or do research at a school eventually, again, uh, can they go back to academia after? So that's one, one, one other question that was, how was the transition and, and if they can go back to academia? And yeah, these, these are the questions that I would like you to you take and then we'll go to okay. Kendra. Yeah, so first off, you could absolutely always 
go back into academia. And it kind of just depends on what you like about that. Um, so one thing about me was that I wasn't really dead set on becoming a tenure track faculty. I wasn't like, I'm so passionate about this. I just want this to be my career. Um, and then I'll, I'll go work in industry as a fallback. That's the wrong way to think about it. Um, you know, industry, when you show up for those interviews, you know, it's not like they look at, oh, you're, you know, you have your PhD, you're qualified, come on in. You know, it's not like that at all. I mean, you have to be suitable. You have to be the right fit for, for organizations um, despite your training. And what I found as a postdoc who had kind of kept going, you know, I gave it a good shot. I think about halfway through, I thought, hey, I'm gonna start a brand new project you know, that, that could carry me into a faculty position if one presented itself, but I had an open mind. And by the time that played itself through, I found myself essentially unemployed and in my mind, almost unemployable. Who wanted to, who would wanna hire this like 36 year old person who's never worked at a company, doesn't really have any experience in, you know, you know, corporate management or any of these other aspects of, you know, policy or fundraising or anything like that. You know, they're looking for people who are fresh, you know, a lot, oftentimes you'll find the scientist positions, you know, they prefer someone who just finished their degree so they can, you know, essentially mold you into what they need. Um, so I, you know, what I found was that it was probably, I probably stayed too long as a postdoc. I was doing lots of other things, obviously, but I, um, you know, I probably spent six months without a job before I took what I could find. Um, and there, obviously there's always gonna be life constraints, you know, my family's here and, well, my, my wife and my son now, but, you know, not my, my extended family, but, you know, we didn't really want to leave Vancouver at the time. And, you know, there's always those sorts of things that are going to be in play. Um, so it was, for me, it was actually like jumping into an empty swimming pool where it's like I had to essentially get a, a cubicle job for, you know, a better part of a year to just sort of like, you know, see if I could get some experience under my belt. And it wasn't a great job. And I won't even talk about that too much. What I will say, though, is that that, allowed me to kind of expand my horizons a little bit. If you get stuck in this track, it's like, well, I, I can only do this because I got a PhD in this field. You know, obviously you're not gonna switch from a neuroscience to like a woodworking job, but you know, there are lots of things that you can you can do with, with, a, with a graduate degree, whether it's a master's or PhD, you know, and oftentimes you have to maybe put yourself out there and, and see what else you can do with it. Um, like relying back on some of those soft skills. So I said, hey, you know, I could work in biotech, I could work for an instrument company, I could work for a pharma company. And eventually I found my way back into this opportunity that kind of presented itself that I was ready for because I didn't like that job. And I was like, when someone came around and said, hey, do you want to stick your neck out and try a startup with me? I was like, you know what? Yeah, I will. But if someone had asked me that when I was in the middle of a postdoc, do you want to just, you know, with no money go out there and try to start a company? I would have been like, oh God, no, I don't want that. So sometimes you just have to kind of free your mind a little bit to, to kind of see those opportunities when they come. And, and like I said, take them when they come. Don't don't pass them by. Wonderful, wonder, wonderful points, Andrew. Thank you very much, really. Yeah, so so you brought up transferable skills and a, and a question came up in the, uh, in the post, which aligns to my uh, next question that I would like to also ask Kendra about his transition her transition sorry to 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 industry to non-academic research and how 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 it was and it was hard or easy and also the question in the chat box it says that uh, what kind of skills or transferable skills do you think that they're important to gain during the academic uh, academic time that can be used uh, during the during the during the post academic career so yeah i, I know that for, for for instance in my field being a PMP, professional, professional uh, manager, uh, uh, project manager, professional, or getting your to get into EIT or PEng are important. But I would like to ask your idea about that, please. Yeah, I feel like a lot of things that I learned from my graduate school experience were very helpful in going into this job. I feel like for me, it was a bit of a smooth transition. And again, that might speak more to the nature of my particular position because there is, it's not exactly a one-to-one, -one, but there is quite an overlap in the sense of the things that you do in my position because of that academic education and research aspect. Um, so a lot of it, like for things like thesis research, obviously that you get a lot of skills out of that, um, paper writing, just the general things, but also things that um, came out of like side tasks from being a grad student, like things like spent time spent TAing, time spent um, 
giving presentations or going to conferences and things like that. Um, Cause a lot of my job does entail delivering workshops and guest lectures and things like that. Um, but also in terms of the actual, um, the actual research aspect, I feel like part of the help for that, which is interesting because I did say I kind of stumbled into this job, but I think a big aspect of it, like the fact that I did do that scholarship and I had been quite active during my master's, um, I think something that really helped that, as I, I know this is supposed to be more focused on research, but I think something that is kind of very complementary to it was the networking aspect, like going to these conferences, getting yourself out there, um, making your work known and getting to meet with all these different people in the industry really helped in that. Because when I had applied and I did the scholarship, they already kind of knew me from previous um, things as well, which I think um, helped with that. Uh, but also just the fact of being versatile and um, going for a variety of projects. A lot of people, like when they do it, they focus on their thesis research, um, which is great because I know you can get a lot of papers out of that. Um, but I think rather than just kind of keeping a narrow focus, it's really important to get involved in multiple projects um, that do kind of stretch you to learn to be um, doing a few different things that you can apply to and learning different skills. Um, one thing that was really useful to me was kind of learning a bit of for my background for coding, that's really complementary to something like GIS, where of course, knowing the basics of GIS is the main important thing, but having something that really helps you stand out, um, that's kind of like an obvious thing to say, but there are a lot of things like, for example, in GIS that a lot of people who are GIS students don't really know. Like even just within the Esri platform, which is again, the main software company that I'm working for, a lot of people who study that, they're, everyone's familiar with ArcGIS Pro, everyone's familiar with ArcGIS Online, everyone's familiar with story maps, but there are so many other things out there that are very accessible to students that can be used for a variety of different things that those other software applications don't touch on, but that no one's really aware of because even you know in academia, there is a little bit of a tendency to stick with what we've already known, what we've already taught, um, and just the ability to go out there um, uh, beyond what you're doing currently in your research. Um, I think it's important to keep up to date yourself with all the other things that you are not necessarily focusing on, but can give you a little bit more of an edge and also just increase your knowledge so that you have those abilities to um, tackle more problems with uh, different tools and things like that. So That's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Kendra. Uh, yeah, so why they... I'm going to ask the same question from Olga that about um, how was uh, how was her transition to uh, to non-academic research about how how easy or how how hard it was and also there's a follow-up question on the chat that um, that uh, that are there any non-job training programs that matter to companies recruiting scientists so I believe that's probably pro professional development courses or any soft skills or whatever that they can get. I know that I think that you are working for government, so uh, yeah, and many people consider government careers in a very stable job. So I would like to have your opinion on that, that uh, to see that what would be the require, requirement to recruit it uh, in, su in such jobs as yours. Please, Olga. Yes, thank you, Emmett. Um, so I, I want to reiterate why my, my fellow panelists here, they say as well that, yes, definitely the transition is, uh, you know, and this career path is not linear in any way. Uh, you need to be open-minded to, again, try different things, uh, ideally throughout your training, like your program, whether it's at the PhD level or the master level, or even during your postdoc, if they're I'm pretty sure there are a variety of opportunities for you to, to try different, um, I would say in the sense of science overall, like science environment. So uh, the way I was always trying to identify that was also identifying, okay, there is the industry, there is a non-for-profit, there is the government, uh, and obviously academia. So uh, from the academia side, like, you know, uh, trying to collaborate, like I say, with other, with your, your fellow graduate students in your own lab to kind of identify and, and collaborate into different projects. And, you know, you can gain new skills and uh, that can help you as well if that's the career path that you want to take. 
um, for the industry as well. There are different internships that you can, you know, identify and that you can try as well through, during that process. Um, Non-for-profit, one of the things that I did, uh, while was not really a for sure non-for-profit, is I was heavily involved and very active throughout my PhD in different um, initiatives and projects that the, either the university has already established or I had actually initiated myself. So one of the one of them was uh, something called Accessible Science Initiative, which was a way to provide uh, science opportunities and 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 different um, you know tools in a way to low and middle income countries. So this was a way for me as well to get back to my country and my region in Colombia. So I actually uh, pulled a bunch of different uh, graduate students together and we worked for like two years on this project uh, and then even continue after I finished my PhD. And then even when I um, came back here to Ottawa and going through the different phases that I have um, experienced, I, we also initiated with different fellow immigrant women uh, a network, a Canadian pan, uh, pan Canadian network of immigrant women scientists across the country. Uh, so through those experiences, we in a way I, I I experienced a little bit of what it was to be in a non for profit organization in a way. Um, so that was a, an opportunity that I used to kind of, uh, you know, identify and, and see how uh, was the opportunities in that field. And then eventually in government, uh, obviously like through the different fellowships and different uh, opportunities that there are. Uh, sometimes there is, what I notice now is that because there is so much infodemic in a way, and when I come with infodemic is that there are so many opportunities out there. Sometimes it's even difficult to kind of find the right one that might be appealing to you. So definitely going into informational interviews with the with the you know the right people maybe in the field that you are interested on whether it's industry again academia government or non for profit and then seeing what and these people itself they because they are already in those fields they can tell you what kind of opportunities are are out there and as a first uh, I would say like as a first step in my opinion what you could do is that once you either have try or not start trying is to see what definitely you don't you don't feel like you really want to do uh so if you from the beginning you say okay this definitely academia is not for me then you can start exploring into the other options uh in that way so i think that that's a, that's a good first step that you can initiate uh and then definitely in government there are different programs um that i'm happy to to share as well especially like recent phd graduates that can apply mostly in science policy um, so that's some of the programs that are as well, and as well identifying many, if it is biomedical scientists itself, there are uh, different or, like government or, or uh, government institutions, obviously, such as the Public Health Agency of Canada or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, who has uh, government laboratories across the country, which, by the way, at the time that I was doing my PhD, even I was not aware of the amount of laboratories that are across the country. Uh, so there are uh, like the variety of opportunities are definitely uh, good out there in that sense. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Yes. So my next question, I'm going to ask uh, Andrew for that. That that for is, is still for the transition. So. So during for, for for if someone made their mind to do the transition, so how they should look for a job and how to start, and the other the one other question about that is that do we do you really need a PhD to do a non academic research job, and other questions that came up is that does pub, do publications matter or not for that for that purpose, and uh, and these are the main questions. And I'm going to add to that that is there any because I'm 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 hearing that, that is there any danger or risk that if someone is sticks to academia for long and they would like to transit transit make a transition to industry, and I think that that's making the, making the timing right matters. But I would like to ask your opinion about these questions, please, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, there's never a good time or a bad time. Um, let's see. Let's start from beginning. So you, it depends on what you want to do, right? Like, um, or even if you don't know what you want to do. So I'm going to say most of the people here don't know what they want to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do really in the end. I was just kind of going through, hey, I'll get a PhD and that might open some doors for me. And then it did, you know, um, but that doesn't mean you need a PhD to work in science or even excel in, in, in industry or non-academic research. Um, it just depends on what you want to do. I mean, if you want to end up being a, you know, a, vice president of research at a pharma company, then 
yeah, you, you might need a PhD. And I think I've heard people talk about, um, you know, kind of hitting that ceiling where, you know, if I had a PhD, I could get promoted to that next level up. But, you know, I have friends who don't even have a master's degree that have worked in biotech for 20 or 30 years who are doing just as well without a, a graduate degree than they might have otherwise. And it's all about kind of your opportunities and, and how you kind of get involved. So if you really don't think you want to do a PhD, don't, you know, um, get out there and see what opportunities exist and, and try to find some, some other roles that, not even other roles, but like, you know, roles that maybe start with a master's level entry or, uh, you know, even, even less. Um, I would say, I just responded to someone else, there's, there's tons of jobs in biotech, for example, that, that don't require a PhD to get your foot in the door. And, you know, you can, if, if it's the right company, you might be able to move up within a company to the point where you have, now you don't have to point to your PhD for what you've done. You can say, hey, I've, I've spent five years doing this, 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 and this. And that can be just as good as pointing to your academic background, you know, for, for maybe your next job. Um, I think these days, you know, and again, coming from the startup world, you know, you're always looking for whatever's coming next because there is not a lot of job security in what I do. So, you know, I think getting these jobs where you're just set for life, I don't know if that's really like how it is anymore. Like, you know, maybe our, our parents had a job and they just had a job for, for their whole life and they, they retired and isn't that great. You know, um, these days you have to be a little more nimble. Um, so what I would recommend in terms of making that transition is just talk to everyone you can um, things I could recommend, uh, UBC and SFU go to the student biotech network, uh, networking events. I, I forget now if they still do them at the milestones on Canby, but anyway, they have regular socials where you can just talk to other students and they have sponsors from the biotechs who, who, who send out people there to just talk and communicate as mentors. And you never know, you might find uh, job opportunities that way. I've met a lot of people through things like that, even when I was postdoc, even though they didn't directly, uh, thanks Jackie, even though that didn't really directly lead to anything, you know, I made all sorts of connections there and I think it enriched my, um, yeah, it enriched my uh, networking experience and it gives you practice. You know, you have to be ready to just kind of go talk to people. And I think, you know, you'll just find that, um, you know, whether it's people you know in, in school or people you meet at things, you know, it's, it sucks. You don't really want to go around shaking hands and try to introduce yourself over and over again. But if you do that a little bit um, and, you know, if you become a familiar face um, at different sort of events, you know, go to, um, you know, if you're in a, a specific field, you know, go to those meetings if you can, even if you're not presenting something. Um, you know, talk to people that, that are passionate about the same things you are, and I guarantee you, the time will pop up and it'll be like, oh, someone just called me. I didn't expect that. And they, they have an opportunity to talk to someone or whatever. And, and you know, I wish I had a, a really good, like, point by point plan. Here's how you go through it. Um, I, in my experience, you kind of have to make your own path. So just create as many opportunities as you can find. And sooner or later, one of them will pan out. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah, I think you're right that finding a job is itself a job. So you should spend a lot of time networking and spending time in it. That's wonderful. Uh, so you mentioned about networking. I'm going to ask the next question from uh, Kendra about networking and how how should we effectively search for, search for jobs outside of common job listing sites like Indeed, Glassdoor, etc. So how should we effectively search for jobs outside of those common listing jobs? And how do we navigate finding positions or jobs that you don't know exist and you do have uh, any suggestions for, for beyond that? For, uh, or, or if you have any suggestion for reaching out to employers beyond simply cold emailing. So if you have any suggestion on that side. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, networking is definitely something that's very important, I think, in a lot of fields um, in science. But um, for this one, at least, uh, definitely networking is so useful. I know I had mentioned um, before, a big thing is going to these conferences, um, getting out there, um, not just going to the conferences to learn. I think that's a great way, um, like, you know, to obviously further yourself, but obviously, like, actually pushing yourself to kind of meet some of these people, talk to the people in the industry, introduce yourself. Um, and also just showing, showcasing your work is a great way to have other people come to you as well. Like if you are willing to, if you have some work that you're willing to present on and you can give a speech, talk about that at these conferences, a lot of people who find value in your work will approach you and you'll have a, 
ability to start a connection that way. And as I kind of touched on before, I think another great way to get out there is also just getting involved in a number of different projects, like whatever projects you can find yourself in, not just, I mean, thesis is kind of, in a sense, the bare minimum, and it's like a really good way to go. Like, I mean, for me, it helped me with my scholarship work, but I think it's not something to just fall back on entirely. I think it is really useful to go and find other projects, even if it's, um, you know, like if it's a co-op thing, if it's a side thing, if you do find a door into um, industry, if you have if you have a professor that you're close to that you can ask that maybe has some other projects that you can work on um, in, the, in the group setting or with their lab. Um, also even things like competition projects are really interesting. Like for ours, like being somewhat in the tech field or tech adjacent, however you wanna call it, um, we do have some competitions that come around annually for things like an app challenge, building an application together as a group. Um, doing other things like that. Um, just anything where you're able to kind of showcase your skill set, And again, kind of being in that um, tech arena, like I think it's really useful to have a portfolio of some sort, something that you can point to, whether it is like um, your traditional portfolio or just having kind of end products of things you've worked on, whether it be a report, a summary, summarizing what you've done, or whether it be a web app that you've built, something like that. I think that's really useful. and in terms of taking that to like the networking aspect of your questioning, um, I think now more than ever, like a really great way to get yourself out there is social media. Like I think before when it was just a time of MySpace and Facebook, that would not be the way to go. But we have great things out there like LinkedIn and even to an extent Twitter, um, just being able to get out there, um, connect with people that you normally would not run into in your everyday circles and being able to showcase work that you're proud of, like show that you are involved, show that you, um, kind of are aware of things that are going on, even if it's not even your work necessarily, like just posting on things that are going on um, in the field, but of course, showcasing your work. I think it's a really great way um, to kind of get attention and to put yourself out there in a way that employers will notice you, um, people who are potentially looking to hire will notice you. And even if it's not a case where someone goes out of their way to headhunt you, there could be always that possibility that if you're hot going for a job in the future, they may remember your name because they've met you or they've seen the work you've done or they've heard from you. Um, so I think all of that is really important um, in order to get your foot in the door for sure. Like just beyond um, the bare minimum of doing a great job in school, obviously that's really important, but also being able to get out there and um, show what you've done, I think is really essential now. Wonderful, wonderful, Kendra. Great points on using social media to leverage the, the networking. That's great. I'm going to ask the same question from Olga and and uh, about how 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 we should effectively search for jobs outside of the common job listing and is there a way to kind of to avoid those simply called emailing but still get connected with employers and a follow-up question for you all guys that i know that you did a you did an internship in my tax i believe and then it it led you to your government job. So the question is that are industry internship training are necessary before leaving your academic position in order to get a job in, in industry or in government? Uh, so those are the questions. Please, Olga. Yeah, the, the science policy fellowship run by MITAX actually was a little bit different than the Elevate and all the other industry fellowships, which MITAX is well known for. This was a unique program in a way, and it was developed again for a short period of time. And the big difference on this it was that MITAX in a way was supporting the process on the recruitment part of the process. But at the end of the day, the employer, the full employer was the government of Canada. So it was in a way, uh, once you were selected and identified as the candidate that uh, was, um, uh, you know, taken on that fellowship, basically you were given a one year term contract with the government of Canada on a specific project. Um, and then after that, there was the opportunities that will come after, depending on uh, how you will have, um, you know, accomplish your milestones of that pro of that specific project, uh, to be offered an extension of that uh, term contract, and eventually, you know, once you are inside, um, you know, like the government of Canada has obviously like the official uh, jobs for the government of Canada, which is they have uh, public facing, they have a specific. Uh, jobs uh, offer for the public to apply, but once you are inside the government, you are open to 
10 times more opportunities. Uh, so that's when, when you are in a term contract, for example, um, you are open to many, many of those options that um, are offered through, through that platform, as well as uh, another option and another way is um, the government of Canada, as you all know, is the major employer of all the country of the whole country. So, um, and, and it's again like the, the 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 locations. While majority, obviously, of the government institutions are in 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 Ottawa, they're actually located across the country. Um, so, and the the information about the contact information about all public servants uh, is public and uh, you can identify if there is a specific area that you are attracted by, whether it's a, an actual government agency and even within a government agency, like let's say in my field, uh, you know, public health agency of Canada, like obviously microbiology, immunology, biomedical uh, sciences. Uh, so I was looking into those units that are somehow related to my field and that I feel more attracted to. So connecting with those units and identifying who are the hiring managers and probably asking for an informational interview was the way to go. Uh, so I definitely recommend doing that. I, I had been putting as well some of the uh, entry level um, recruitment programs that the government of Canada has, especially for recent graduates, whether our master's PhDs. Um, there are two major programs, again, in, in addition to that, program from MITACS, which uh, unfortunately, like I say, it, it closed. But these two other programs that I posted in the chat actually are active and they recruit only once a year. Um, the recruitment process usually is, uh, usually are, are long and almost to the same level of detail to apply into a, a scholarship or a fellowship. So it's, it's, it's you know, it takes a little while. Um, but once you are in, as I say, you give the opportunity you kind of open the opportunity to many, many other options that you can uh, identify once you are inside. Uh, I just want to highlight two points uh, briefly to what previous questions that will be important probably in the field of the government of Canada and in the government in general, because I will, be, I will think that this is the same thing at the provincial level as well as the city level, is that a PhD, my, a PhD degree itself might not be, um, you know, heavily needed depending on obviously on the on the um in the in the government usually you have jobs depending on the classification that you are entering so if the classification is purely a scientist classification yes definitely you are going to probably need that phd level uh but if you are entering to other classifications where your phd skills are transferable to the job that you are doing then that phd degree itself are not going to count much because it was it's going to be equally beneficial as you having been in government since the moment you finish undergraduate, pretty much. So it's, uh, it's in, in that sense, um, is that. Publications, the same thing. Having said that, I have been very stubborn, and this is just me. Every time I, uh, so I, I work really hard throughout my PhD years, and I, uh, I'm very proud of my publication record. Uh, so I'm always highlighting publications because I feel that I contributed to science and I contributed to the field uh, that were very close to my heart. So I'm always highlighting those those publications. Obviously, not not the whole list. I just basically just highlight the two or three major ones, um, and then mention the number of the other ones and so on, and the impact that this brought to 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 the science field. So that that was for probably that that something that is important to it would be up to you as well to to identify that. I know the different fields have different options into what is the importance of that. And then one other thing in that transition as well uh, that I felt per personally is that that when you're moving into a different area where you are not really again as a biomedical scientist when you're not at the bench actually doing research work, you feel like that identity in a way of you as a scientist is somehow like a little bit removed from that. But then it was a way of reminding myself on a regular basis that, you know, I was on a daily basis, you know, making an impact just from a different perspective and, you know, kind of bringing those skills and expertise that I had and into that informed decision making that was in a way uh, making a difference in, in the country as a whole. So I think that that, that was something, in a well, a hard path that I had to uh, pass in a way. Uh, and I just wanted to share that. That, that's wonderful, Olga. And that's great that you are also valuing the publications, which is which postdocs have a heavy emphasis on that. And that's great that 
people in government and industry also having that that perspective uh, in their way. If I may just add something. Yeah, for sure, for sure, Andrew, please. Oftentimes when you're in a grad student, especially if you're doing a PhD and you're at it for a while, you're like, wow, this is my thing. I'm in the lab. I always want to be in the lab. I love the lab. You know, you want to be in the lab. You want to be get your hands wet and get them all that stuff. But don't forget, like, the science isn't on the bet. I mean, the, 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 the technical aspects are, but, you know, I'm no less of a scientist now that I'm, you know, uh, heading up some R&D program and dealing with individual organizations or individuals or consultants who are kind of doing the wet work for me. You know, you really don't be scared of that kind of more management role. And I think a lot of people, even if you go into academic uh, sort of tenure track faculty position, you know, there's a, there's still this like, oh, but then I won't be in the lab anymore. And it's like, I, I guarantee you, 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 you know, unless you're the sort of person that just loves, to, you just want to be in there forever. Like you may find as you get, as you get on that, like you're happy to not be in the lab anymore. You're, you, you realize that, you know, your mentorship of those students and those, those other you know, postdocs or whatever, um, is is actually all of a sudden you're not just you on the bench you have this like organism of a lab that that now you can kind of direct without actually being on the bench so don't be afraid to get off the bench is what Sam that's that's wonderful point really Andrew thank you very much uh, and that uh, brings me to the to the next question who is I, I I had a I had a question for Olga uh which is about um, about in international students so several several people submitted the question especially advice for international students and i know about your international background so would you have any specific advice to international postdocs or students please olga about this uh, about approaching <laughs> to jobs and they are still dealing with their immigration process too but they would like to hear from someone like you who is also an immigrant Please yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that that was definitely like you know a, a, an interesting path uh, that I took as well. And as you all say, like yes, being an international student is harder because you have limited options as well to apply to scholarships uh, and fellowships and so on and so forth. I was very fortunate to have obtained the Vanier uh, um, scholarship during my PhD, which was the only option I had as an international student to to obtain. Uh, so that was uh, one thing, and that in a way also allowed you to um, kind of start thinking about ways to getting involved even more with the community, with the network, with trying to understand better, uh, right? Because you are, in my case, it was a little bit helpful that I had been again in the U.S. prior coming to Canada, so in a way it was a, a similar environment in the research field, but um overall like you know understanding better the culture and uh, like the way i did everything was as well getting heavily involved in many many of the activities that the university was having uh that they again the, the graduate um school was organizing through the different programs i know jackie uh from very early in my in my uh phd because again i i was heavily involved and, and attending many of the opportunities and the options that um, the, the graduate uh, program was providing and, and overall. And so basically like attending all of those events and looking into the opportunities out there is definitely beneficial as an international student. And then obviously to try to understand better how the um, job market is once you finish your PhD or your postdoc and how uh, you know how you can navigate that whether you have already your immigration um papers resolved or and if not like you know what other options you have in there um so that initiating all that process since day one that you start your degree i think that that could be the best approach that i can recommend uh, and that personally helped me a lot through through my process so that's wonderful thank you very much olga uh I believe that we are getting close to a time that we should go and ask the question and start the Q&A session, I believe. So, uh, Jackie, I believe that shall we uh, stop the recording or? Uh, I Sure, if people want to put up their hand and ask questions, yeah. but maybe um, 
it would be great to get on the recording the panel okay, sure. sort of final words of wisdom for those unable to join and then maybe we'll uh, we'll stop it and then give people if people don't want to be on camera the opportunity to speak but there have been amazing questions in the chat so far so. absolutely absolutely so we'll get your final word of wisdom and or, and call to action for every one of you great panelists and then we will go to a question and answer session Please, we'll start with uh, Kendra. So your final words and- oh, Words of wisdom, of yeah. Uh, I feel <laughs> like it's, I think the thing is just, there's a lot of uncertainty when you're in school, not sure what you do, not sure how far you wanna go with academia, not sure how far you need to go. But I think the important thing is just um, to be flexible and to keep learning keep applying what you know to help solve the things that you don't um, and just keep pushing yourself. And like we had touched on, like during this whole meeting, it's like a whole thing of being well-rounded, um, conferences, networking, doing whatever you can to really um, make the most kind of of your graduate experience. And then that will really help when you go, try to go and transition into the workforce, I feel. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Kendra. And I'm going to ask Andrew about his word of business. Well, yeah. Um, thank you for having me, by the way. Um, here's what I would say. If you're a postdoc or you're think, thinking about leaving academia, you know, staying in academia isn't helping you. So don't stay too long if, if, you, if you can help it. Obviously, COVID froze us all where we were for a while that that affected everyone and it shouldn't it shouldn't be a factor in people's decisions but you know i probably was too stayed for too long as a postdoc and had to had to kind of go backwards a little bit to go forward um so think about that i mean obviously people keep their um options open and you know maybe you want to apply for um you know faculty positions alongside your industry positions but just remember you may have to put just as much work into the industry position than the faculty position you, can, you won't just fall into it um, if you're a PhD student, um, you know, consider what I was just saying about, you know, you might not always want to be on the bench, you might not want to be pipetting when you're in your 50s. Maybe you are, I don't know, um, but you probably won't be. Um, so to keep that in mind and, and realize that people who just finished a PhD, um, I think, are right for the picking for certain kinds of scientist positions at, at biotech companies. Um, if you're a master's student, don't feel like you have to get a PhD. Again, you know, apply for some jobs while you're applying for a PhD program or, um, you know, think hard about whether a PhD would actually get you further in that particular career you have in mind. And if you if you're like me and you just don't really know and you think maybe, um, you know, you're just into science and you want to get a PhD to open doors for you, there's no harm in doing that either. Um, but yeah, keep an open mind, create opportunities for yourself and don't be afraid to take them when they come along. Wonderful points, Andrew, really. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last person, but not the least, is Olga. Please, please share your final words about any advice that you have for us. Absolutely. Uh, again, just echoing a little bit of what already has been said, but of and, and what I have mentioned before, uh, be open-minded throughout the, during, during your path of your graduate degree. Uh, try different uh, things uh, towards the end of your degree uh, or your postdoc. I will say the first thing you need to do is identify what you don't want to do for sure. Uh, and then go from there on of what options you can do uh, or you want to try at least. Um, that, that, that will give you a better perspective because I know that the process is daunting. Uh, you know, when there are so many options out there and you don't even want, you don't even know which ones you might like or you might feel more connected to, like everything is on paper or is like what other people's experiences have had. And, and you know, we are all different and <laughs> what it might be good, uh, might have been a good fit for me, might not be the same for you. So this is an experience and a process that you yourself, they ha you have to go through and you have to give the opportunity to go through that process. Um, again, like be patient, be, uh, you know, be, be kind with yourself. This is, again, it's not an easy process. It's not a linear process. Um, definitely, you know, ask for a hand. We all have passed through these different challenges. I'm always open to share one-on-one -on -one, uh, more um, advice. 
I have shared again several programs uh, in the chat. Uh, again, like try to contact several people that you feel like try to connect social media, like LinkedIn, identify which people might be of interest that work in different areas. And again, like I just shared actually the public directory that I was telling you about the Government of Canada um, employees, and you can identify the contact of that person and then see how you can connect with the people that you might be interested. Again, this is in government per se. Because uh, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes you just send emails on LinkedIn and people don't re respond. So, uh, so sometimes maybe uh, connecting directly into their work email might be a better approach. Um, but yeah, so again, like be patient, be kind on yourselves, and keep trying like, the different options and be open-minded. Uh, and for sure, you will find what's the right fit for all for you and in your in your experience. I had one more point this that's sort of related to the people wondering like, hey, you know, how do I get more like a PhD, more than my PhD if people just don't want academics necessarily, what else can you do? You know, is this a dark side thing, but don't be afraid to talk about money. If you can demonstrate financial literacy, that will go a long way in, you know, um, you know, integrating into, you know, companies um, and even nonprofits that need money to operate. Uh, you know, for better or for worse, money makes the world go round. And I think one thing that a lot of academics don't ever really have is that grip on, you know, the kind of the line item budget stuff, learn how to operate a budget, learn how to, um, you know, read a, a, a financial table if you can. Um, that'll go a long way towards um, demonstrating that you're not just a lab rat. Yeah. And Wonderful. If you don't mind, uh, Emma, since you Absolutely. mentioned money, since you mentioned money, Andrew, that also bring me a, a point here. And again, for, um, you know, again, like uh, minorities and again, like all of these op options of trying and being open-minded and everything as well that come with privilege. If again, if sometimes at the end of the day, we all need to pay the bills and we all need to, uh, you know, um, you know, if, if you consider that, you don't have the options to be trying 10 different things during 10 different years. And you just need yeah. to just set a, a path uh, because you need to look over your family or your needs, uh, your, your individual needs, then just, you know, set a specific path and just finding that job that might be the right for you and then go ahead. Uh, I think that that's also need to be considered in that, in that regard that, um, yeah, so that th those options might come with, with, with some privilege and, and we all need to consider that. Wonderful point. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all. I believe that we are in the right point to move towards Q and A session. So, uh, yeah, and we can ask participants to raise their hand and ask questions, and I'll take the take care of a few questions.